So if you could start by telling me uh, when you joined Facebook and how it plays, what role it plays now in your work. I started off using Twitter, and Twitter to me seemed the natural journalistic medium. And it wasn't until, it was only three years ago that I got onto Facebook, and it was because a colleague of mine, a former colleague, Carrie Powell, said to me, you have to be there because there are all kinds of people in Edmonton, especially women living in the suburbs, who only get their news from Facebook. And I was so shocked by that idea. I didn't understand how it worked. I thought of it just as a way that people gossiped and socialized. I didn't realize to what extent the Facebook news feed has become a vector for the exchange of media information. You also you post a lot of your ideas beforehand as well on Facebook, right? I see that right. sometimes. What I've tried to do with Facebook, I use it very differently than I do Twitter. I try and use Facebook to build community and to have conversation. It, in some ways, we tried to do that with our blog, The Edmonton Commons, but it was a very troll-ridden environment. And what Facebook, it seems to be a little more self-policing in terms of the fact that people have to like me. They have to be a fan of my fan page. So they're self-selected to be a little bit more civil. And then they sort of police one another. So what I've really been able to do on Facebook is to use it not just to pump out my column, but to spark conversation. So sometimes, even before the column goes to press, I will tell people, this is what I'm working on. Can we brainstorm ideas together? And we can have a really good conversation where I can sort of practice my debating points before I put them in the newspaper. And then after the column does go live, it becomes a place where people can have a really good conversation in a way, frankly, that our comment boards on our main page don't allow because they're not policed in the same way. I moderate mine, and as I say, people kind of um, police one another. So we end up having still passionate conversations, but conversations that don't tend to devolve into the trollery that, uh, that the main page can. Mm -hmm. Can most of that happen during your regular nine to five day or do you spend a lot of no. time off? No, yeah. um, in, in the house we call them my goldfish and I have to keep feeding the goldfish on a regular basis. So I'm usually up because I'm a working mom at 5.30 or 6 in the morning and one of the first things I do is I sign on to Twitter and Facebook to see how things have gone. Um, I, I run the site through the day, but it's really in the evening that it's the most busy because that's when people seem to want to be on Facebook is in that after supper hour. So I'm often, you know, I'll do all my family things and then I'm back on the computer patrolling the Facebook page. And But, you know, it's also, once you get it going, it maintains some of its own energy. I remember at one point I'd posted, I can't even remember what the topic was, but it was quite a controversial column. And then I said to the people, okay, I'm going out to the theater now. So you can talk amongst yourselves. And when I came back, there were about 30 posts and people had had a really good debate without my needing to be there. So in some ways, it's really quite wonderful. It's like, I feel quite maternal about it. I sort of set it in motion and then they run with it. And I've been able to attract a really good community of people. So some of the people who sort of seeded it are my actual, you know, my real friends. Um, and other people are people from the community who've come there on purpose. You know, one of the people who's a regular contributor is the former assistant deputy minister of health, who is a regular uh, poster there. I don't know him at all, I've never met him, but he brings a really informed perspective to the debate there. Other people are former civil servants, uh, lawyers, doctors, you know, people who are active in the community who come there initially because I wrote about something that was of particular interest to them but now they've joined that community conversation. So even though I only have about 2,500 official fans who are members, they are all people who tend to be quite well connected themselves. So they will share out my pieces. So I can quite often, I mean, sort of my standard metric is I have about 15,000 uh, interactions or 15,000 views a week. Um, and a really big story can have a much larger multiplier effect. Mm -hmm. Can you, how does that relate to traditional views of journalism? I mean, I imagine that many students who get into journalism think about reporting where they interview somebody and they write a piece. Columnists seem to be thinking about something, writing a piece. This fostering debate online, is that part of journalism too? How, how does that work? Well, it's part of journalism to me. I don't think it necessarily has to be for everyone. When I was in high school and university, I was a very active member of my debate club. 
I love debate. I love the idea that I, ideas that clash and come into conflict lead to a better understanding. I am not really interested in just having Paula's sermons where I produce the column and there it is and you can read it and two weeks later you can write me a letter about it. What I love about the social media environment is that I hear from people right away, instantaneously, in real time, about the things that I write. And to me, I think it's part of my role as an opinion leader in this community to incite that public debate. So it's not just about me going blah, 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 although God knows I like to go blah, blah, blah. It's far more interesting for me to have the conversation, to hear back from people, and then to set the spark that gets them talking amongst themselves so that even if I'm just curating the conversation and moderating it, I'm letting other smart people come to my Facebook page and they drive the conversation. I provide the stimulus, I provide the incentive that sets people off, but then they carry the ball forward. And to me, that building of community and that building of a social dialogue is incredibly important to the value of the work I bring to the Edmonton Journal and that I bring to Edmonton. Mm -hmm. Talking about the future of newspapers now, um, I know that you gave a, a lecture recently on the economics of newspapers. A grim subject. <laughs> yeah, great. Um, I think a lot of people think about the internet as a place where they can get more people reading, they can sell ads, they can send out links. Is it just that or is there more and how might that affect the economic picture of the, of the journal and of newspapers? Well, this is the trick, right? Because every time someone's on my Facebook page, Facebook is making money. Facebook is selling ads. The Edmonton Journal isn't making money from that. And it used to be that I told myself that I was posting the links and that would drive the traffic to the website and then we'd get the ad impressions. But now that we've got a paywall up, and I, I shouldn't probably be saying this, but if you go to my Facebook page, you, don't, you get around the paywall. So at the way our paywall is set up, it's more like a pay hedge. It's very porous. It's full of holes. So if you link to an Edmonton Journal story through my page, it doesn't count on our pay meter. So in fact, I don't know that this is a very good way for the paper to make money in the short term. But I think long term, until we can figure out how we're going to monetize a digital newspaper, what's vitally important is that people in the community still feel that we have social value to the city. If people don't think that there's something special they get from the Edmonton Journal and from Edmonton Journal writers, then they'll go to the HuffPost or they'll go to Metro or they'll go to the CBC or to other websites that are national or international. I have to convince people all the time, and I hate to say brand, I, I don't think of myself as a brand. Brands are for cows and, and for soup. Uh, but I want to be somebody that people in the community look to as a source of information, as a source for idea, as an inspiration for conversation. And if I can't help to keep the Edmonton Journal top of mind for people when they think, who do I turn to for trustworthy, reliable information? I think our brand equity is the most important thing we possess right now because it's really all we have that differentiates us in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Last question is, any, any advice that you have for students that are just um, graduating and trying to get a job and, and learn to be news writers now? You have a huge advantage because you are growing up fluent in the digital social media universe and lots of media managers who are older than me or indeed younger than me don't understand the currency of social media. So don't discount. I was really interested when I was at the um, CUP conference earlier this year, how many newspapers are still only really in print, that they aren't doing daily updates of their campus newspaper online, how few people have actually established blogs for themselves or Facebook fan pages. So you need to make yourself as fluent as possible in the media of your generation because that is going to differentiate you. But you also need to understand the value of having credibility. So whenever you're on social media, you are representing either your campus newspaper or the future reporter you're going to be. So if you have a private Facebook page where you post pictures of yourself getting drunk or talking about your breakup, that's cool. Don't mix that up with your professional life. So you want to have maybe a professional Facebook page that has a different kind of branding ugh, um, that puts you out in the marketplace so that you're saying, this is what I do on social media. It's not just about um, counting the notches in my bedpost. Thanks. <laughs>